Space, the final frontier. The great beyond that stretches further than we can even comprehend. It's a place that feels so empty, yet contains everything. Humans have been looking up at the sky in wonder, curiously dreaming about what could be beyond the confines of our own planet throughout our entire history. Some imagined gods at work like Ra pulling the sun across the sky. Some theorized about other life similar to ours on their own little oasis in the void of space. But some decided that they would go see for themselves. On July 20th, 1969, American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to ever land on the moon. Just six hours later, Armstrong would gain the title of the first person to walk on the moon. This came eight years after President John F. Kennedy announced a national goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. The effort, which officially began in an appeal to Congress in 1961, ended up cementing America as the winners of the space race. It was an accomplishment that sent ripples through the science community. Russia may have been the first to leave the atmosphere, but America planted their flag on the lunar surface. Yet, this was not the only feat America was hoping to flaunt to the world. In fact, it might not have even been the first if things had gone according to plan. The real show of power the United States wanted to show the world it was capable of was to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon. This is the second video in my ongoing series about the peaceful nuclear explosion movement, also known as Atoms for Peace. If you missed the first one, that's okay. This video is self-contained enough that you can watch it on its own. But if you want more context on this era and to learn more about the time the US tried to bomb a new Panama Canal into existence, you can click here to go watch it. And if you like these videos and want to see more, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. Okay, now back to the video. It was pitch black when Greg Spriggs' father brought his whole family to the highest point on the Midway Atoll on July 8, 1962. That night, on another atoll, a thousand miles away, the US military was scheduled to launch a rocket into space to test a fusion bomb. Spriggs, who would later go on to become a weapons physicist, recalled that his father was looking around a lot. He was trying to figure out which direction to look. He thought there was going to be this little flicker in the sky, so he wanted to make sure everyone was going to see it. But the Spriggs family weren't the only ones turning their eyes to the sky that night. Spectators were also holding watch the bomb parties in Hawaii as the countdown was broadcast over shortwave radio. Photographers aimed their lenses toward the horizon and debated the best camera settings for capturing a thermonuclear explosion in outer space. Nobody was quite sure what it would look like or what to expect. It turned out that the blast, a 1.4 megaton bomb, 500 times as powerful as the one that fell on Hiroshima, was not going to be subtle. When that nuclear weapon went off, the whole sky lit up in every direction. It looked like it was noon, said Spriggs. The nuke, codenamed Starfish Prime, exploded at an altitude of 250 miles, roughly the height of where the International Space Station orbits today. For as long as 15 minutes after the initial explosion, charged particles from the blast collided with molecules in Earth's atmosphere, creating an artificial aurora that could be seen as far away as New Zealand. Then came the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse that comes with any nuclear explosion shut down radio stations, set off emergency sirens, and knocked out numerous electric devices. The damage to both civilian and military electrical systems led physicist Lowell Wood to declare that if the starfish test had taken place at the Nevada test site, much closer to the neighboring cities and towns, the consequences of the EMP would still be imprinted in the minds of citizenry of the western US as well as in history books. At the time, scientists and military higher-ups were keen to know what would happen if a nuclear explosion were set off in space, especially how it might interact with Earth's magnetosphere. Just two years earlier, America's first satellite, Explorer 1, accidentally discovered the Earth is encircled by donuts of intense radiation held in place by its magnetic field. They were subsequently named Van Allen belts after James Van Allen, the University of Iowa scientist who discovered them. When NASA discovered the radiation belts, they found that space was not totally empty, but full of radioactivity. This was worrying because they feared it may inhibit any spacecraft or astronauts from leaving the atmosphere. Before the test, scientists thought that the impacts of starfish prime on Earth's radiation belts would be minimal. But they were wrong. After four days of delays waiting for the perfect weather, Starfish Prime was launched on the tip of a Thor rocket from Johnston Atoll, an island about 750 nautical miles southwest of Hawaii. 
The military also sent up 27 smaller missiles full of scientific instruments to measure its effects. Planes and boats got into position to record the test in as many ways as possible, and flares were set off in hopes of distracting local birds from the blinding flash to come. Scientists already had an idea that a nuclear blast in space would behave differently from one on the ground. There is no mushroom cloud or double flash. People on the ground don't feel a shock wave or hear any sound. There's just a big bright ball of plasma, which appears to change color as charged particles from the blast are pushed down into the atmosphere by Earth's magnetic field. This effect generates colorful artificial auroras, and is why these high altitude nukes were sometimes called rainbow bombs. As Earth's magnetic field caught ionized radiation from the starfish prime test, it created a new artificial radiation belt that was stronger and longer lasting than scientists had predicted. This unexpected starfish belt, as they called it, which lingered for at least 10 years, destroyed Telstar 1, the first satellite to broadcast a live television signal, and Ariel 1, Britain's first satellite. It came as a surprise how bad it was and how long it lasted, as well as how damaging it was to satellites that flew through that area. The test did reveal some important information about radiation around Earth. The bomb released a special isotope tracer called cadmium-190. Its original purpose was to track the fallout from the test, but it also became a valuable resource for understanding weather patterns in the upper atmosphere. The test also helped the US understand how to detect nuclear detonations in space and build a system, later called Vela Hotel, that's used to monitor tests by other countries. Such advances helped to make a treaty to ban nukes in space more realistic. There's a chance that, if a nuclear bomb goes off in space again, it could have disastrous effects. Imagine a prolonged EMP like a solar flare. It would start disrupting satellites and all of your electronics. A lot more things are dependent on computer chips and power than they did in 1962. Things in your house, things in your car, communications, etc. Starfish Prime and the resulting Starfish Belt gave researchers an incentive to come up with a way to combat such disastrous effects. In the unlikely event another nuclear bomb goes off in space, Joff Reeves, a research fellow at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, has been working on a quick way to get rid of the radiation belts made from nuclear blasts. In his design, a transmitter mounted on a satellite hits the trapped radiation with specialized AM radio waves, which nudged the charged particles lower into the atmosphere where they would be harmlessly absorbed. So theoretically, if another radiation belt were to form, you could get rid of it in a couple of weeks. But what about the moon? In the late 1950s, Washington set into place a secret operation to examine the feasibility of detonating a thermonuclear device on the surface of our closest celestial neighbor. It was codenamed Project A119. It may seem outlandish and borderline children's movie villain-esque, but consider the context of the Cold War. Paranoia and distrust had reached fever pitch on both sides of the Iron Curtain by the late 1950s, and military one-upsmanship was the order of the day. The situation went code red in October of 1957 when the USSR successfully launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik. The deployment caught the world by surprise. It was not only a great technological advancement, but was intended as a symbol of Russian superiority. The Americans in the West were terrified of the concept that potentially the Soviets had beaten us at our own game. We'd always been the big kids in science and technology, the people who invented new and innovative things. All of the sudden, the Soviets had beaten us into space. Doubling the sense of threat was the fact that Sputnik had been launched into orbit on what was essentially an intercontinental ballistic missile. The West was given a shock with the launch of Sputnik, and very quickly the US government flew into action and said, we need to do something very spectacular. We need to do something so big that the whole world will know that this was just an anomaly, that Sputnik was just a blip, that the United States is still the big kid on the block. And with that, Project A119 was born. The idea behind the project was ambitious, yet simple to create an explosion in lunar mushroom clouds so awe-inspiring and unavoidable that no matter where you lived on planet Earth, it would be impossible to ignore the extent of America's military and technological might. When delivering the initial findings in June of 1959, cost was among the major reasons why the project was scuttled. But he says there were also concerns about damaging the lunar landscape and the fact that, in the event that it missed, it could come back to Earth. 
Dr. Rifle's secret report into the feasibility of a lunar detonation was eventually declassified in 2000. It carried a rather innocuous title, a study of lunar research flights. It suggested that detonating a nuclear device on the moon was technically feasible, but it gave no substantive detail as to how it might be done. The project would never make it to the operational phase. Dr. Rifle himself expressed his personal relief after the report was declassified, saying, I am horrified that such a gesture to sway public opinion was ever considered. In the end, some would get their wish, as in 2009, NASA slammed a Centaur rocket booster into the moon, kicking up 350 tons of debris that spewed up to 6 miles high. Nothing compared to the damage of a nuke, but maybe we can call it good enough. Thanks for watching. I am really loving this series. I'm looking forward to getting the rest of the videos out over the next few months. If you like this one, don't forget to check out the first one too, and subscribe if you like the content and want to be notified of future videos. Thanks again, and see you next time!